So, we meet again, Internet. I owe a great deal to the Internet. It has been a wonderful tool that has allowed me to employ my abilities to an extent which I would likely not have been able otherwise. On the other hand, I often feel that, given that the Internet was built from the ground up expressly to multiply individual power, Few seem interested in taking on the individual responsibility to ensure that that power is properly used. Case in point. On the 24th of September, 2019, two respected physicists, Jakob Schultz of Durham University in the UK and James Unwin of the University of Illinois, presented a paper on Archive, a preprint server that allows academics to spitball slightly off-the-wall ideas at one another, which might not withstand the rigor of full peer review. Their idea is that Planet Nine, the planet believed to be many times Neptune's orbit from the Sun, is in fact not a planet, but a black hole. And not just any black hole, a primordial black hole. Whatever its initial intentions, the paper has caused an explosion. In the 40 or so days since it has appeared on Archive, the combined Google search for Black Hole and Planet Nine has topped 90,000 hits. I am far from the first YouTuber to exposit on this topic. But for all that, there is an important fact to consider. We have no evidence that primordial black holes exist. They are, as of now, purely theoretical. So, before we, the easily excited denizens of the web, start envisioning futures like those presented in Interstellar or The Expanse, I feel it would be prudent to a. find evidence that primordial black holes actually exist, B. Allow Mike Brown and Constantine Batygin to continue their search for Planet Nine for the ten years they claim it will take. C. Let the next generation of telescopes, which should be online by the time the search concludes, the chance to search at higher magnifications. And finally, D. Rule out any of the half dozen or so alternate explanations already suggested for the clustering that inspired the search for Planet Nine in the first place. Remember, all that exists of Planet Nine right now, is a bizarre clustering of the orbits of the most distant observed solar system objects. Planet Nine is an inference from that observation, and not necessarily the correct one. There is always the possibility, so exemplified by Bode's law, that it may be a complete coincidence. And even if it isn't, there's no reason to jump to such an esoteric conclusion. As Mike Brown himself tweeted just two days after the paper's appearance, quote, Yep, P9 could definitely be a black hole as long as it is the right mass, six times the mass of the Earth. In fact, it could also be a six-Earth mass hamburger. The physics only cares about the mass, not the composition. That said, P9 is probably neither a black hole nor a hamburger. Unquote. In the early 19th century, when the disturbances in Uranus's orbit were first observed, many hypotheses were proposed to explain it. But the simplest answer was always that a planet lay beyond it. And that turned out to be correct. Nature has a way of conforming to Occam's razor. I think we should give it time to do so again. So, what is a primordial black hole? Perhaps I should be asking, what is a black hole? Well, there's a question. Black holes are the mystical made mundane. Paradoxes made flesh. They both are and are not. When we see a black hole as we did this year thanks to the phenomenal work of the team behind the Event Horizon Telescope, we do not see a physical, solid object. A black hole is simply a spherical shadow cast onto the universe by a singularity. What is a singularity? Well, you got me. And the entire scientific world, for that matter. A singularity is a point in space that contains a finite mass, but no volume, and thus infinite density. And before you ask, no, that doesn't make sense, but it is in accordance with Einstein's predictions, which has led many to conclude that here, at this point, is where Einstein's vision of the universe breaks down, just as Newton's broke down in relativistic conditions. A black hole is essentially a three-dimensional, spherical hole in the universe itself, a hole that removes everything, even light, from it. Forever. Einstein had predicted black holes, but instinctive classicists that he was did not initially believe they could exist. But try as they might, 
theoreticians could not cancel them out. With the advent of radio astronomy in the 1930s, several promising candidates for possible black holes emerged from the dark. The first astronomical radio signal was detected by accident in 1932, when Carl Jansky, an employee at Bell Telephone searching for static sources, discovered a vastly powerful radio emission, stronger even than the sun, that emanated from the center of our galaxy. It would come to be known as Sagittarius A. Radio astronomy identified several such radio sources throughout the sky over the succeeding decades. In 1963, astronomers Alan Sandage and Thomas Matthews connected one such radio source to a visible object, a blue star-like point that displayed emission lines never seen before. These strange creatures came to be called quasi-stellar radio sources, later shortened to quasars. Studies of quasars would eventually solve the mystery of their strange emission lines. They were those of common elements, such as hydrogen or magnesium, only redshifted by up to nearly 40%, which meant they must be moving at 40% the speed of light, and also staggeringly far away, farther than any galaxy yet seen. This, in turn, meant that they had to be soul-searingly bright, brighter even than supernovae, which in their brief existences can outshine entire galaxies. For decades, many refused to believe that these monsters could exist. Perhaps they were nearby, but so massive that the light had redshifted as it struggled out of their gravity well. But over time, their true natures were revealed, particularly in 1971, when astronomers James Gunn and Bruce Peterson noted not only that quasars were surrounded by galaxies, but that those galaxies were redshifted identically to the quasars. They really were that far away, and that bright. But what could these thundering cosmic engines be? What could possibly generate such phenomenal power as to be seen across billions of light years? Observations showed that light from these strange objects sometimes fluctuated over the course of a month, suggesting that it must emanate from a source smaller than one light month in size, or about 5,000 AU, a distance comparable to our own solar system. In 1964, astronomers Edwin Salpeter and Yakov Zeldovich first suggested that the engine could be a gigantic black hole. Contrary to popular belief, black holes do not possess infinite sucking power. If they did, everything in the universe would be inside one by now. Sorry, Doctor, but it is perfectly possible for a planet, or indeed anything else, to orbit a black hole. Things only start getting irretrievable when you cross the event horizon, the shadow beyond which nothing can be known. Matter falling into a black hole forms a kind of terminal queue, piling up as the black hole takes its time to consume it. As the material nears the event horizon, the black hole's insane gravity pushes it to inconceivable velocities, until friction from collisions rockets its temperature to hundreds of millions of degrees and converts its matter into energy, which blasts away as X-rays. Initially, the idea that colossal black holes millions of times more massive than the Sun could be lurking in the centers of distant galaxies across the universe was too outlandish to accept. However, minds would soon begin to change. One of the less appreciated reasons for our existence is that X-rays cannot penetrate our atmosphere. But, as X-ray observatories began to peak above it, first on rockets, then in orbit, we began to see X-ray sources everywhere we looked. One such source was known as Cygnus X-1. Cygnus X-1 is an optically dark but X-ray bright object orbiting an optically bright but X-ray dim star and the fact that it is orbited by a star allows us to measure both its size and mass, which showed it was far too dense even for a neutron star. It could only be a black hole. In 1974, two of the greatest black hole theorists of the 20th century, Stephen Hawking and Kip Thorne, made a bet over the identity of Cygnus X-1. Thorne said it was a black hole. Hawking said it wasn't. If he won... Thorne demanded his reward be a subscription to Penthouse magazine. Hawking chose Private Eye, a British satirical news magazine. In 1990, 16 years later, Hawking 
accompanied by his family and nurses, in Thorne's words, broke into his office at Caltech and officially conceded, signing his concession with his thumbprint. Also in 1974, astronomers Bruce Ballack and Robert Brown discovered the radio source within Sagittarius A, a bright, compact region Brown nicknamed Sagittarius A asterisk, because asterisks are used to denote atoms in an excited state, and Brown found the discovery exciting. It is at moments like this that the writer in me weeps for the loss of the Renaissance man. In 2002, an international team was able to show that the orbits of stars around Sagittarius A asterisk, or more colloquially, Sagittarius A star, indicated that it was just 60 million kilometers across, slightly wider than Mercury's orbit around the Sun, and yet outmassed our Sun by 4 million times. Once again, such an object was too dense to be any form of conventional matter, and could only be a black hole. Redshift studies of nearby galaxies had demonstrated similar effects at their cores as well, suggesting that they too possessed supermassive black holes. In fact, the only difference between the gargantuan quasars and our own galaxy appeared to be age. Quasars' immense distance meant that they must exist far back in the earliest history of our universe, when galaxies were young and still in the throes of adolescence. At one time, our own supermassive black hole likely hosted its own quasar, but settled down once all food within its reach had been consumed. Today, Sagittarius A star is in repose after its long meal, though it still grabs the occasional snack. Cygnus X1 and Sagittarius A star are archetypal examples of the two forms of black hole we currently know exist. Stellar mass black holes, which form from the deaths of massive stars, and supermassive black holes, which lie at the cores of galaxies. Of the two, stellar mass black holes are by far the easiest to explain. If I wanted to be glib, and I do, I would say that a star is what happens when hydrogen goes down. No, really, stop tittering, I'm serious. When we think of down, we tend to see it as a straight Euclidean direction, as plain as a Cartesian point. But this, of course, is not true. Our world is a sphere. North, south, east, and west all curve along its surface, and down ends at the center. It is impossible to go down farther than the Earth's radius, because to go any farther is to go up the other way. This is just true for stars. Stars form from instabilities within giant clouds of hydrogen called nebulae. A force, likely the death of another star, pushes enough hydrogen into one place that it begins to collapse under its own weight, pulling itself down towards its center. This unfathomable weight places so much pressure on its center that it crushes the hydrogen within it into helium. This event produces a huge amount of energy, enough to counter the downward force of the star's collapse. This delicate balance of fusion propping up and gravity pushing down is the state in which stars spend the majority of their active lives and is known as the main sequence. But, sooner or later, a star must exhaust its available fuel and stop fusing. And when it does, something else will have to prop the star up. What that something is depends very much on just how much weight is pushing down. For a star the size of our Sun, that countering force is called electron degeneracy pressure, a quirk of quantum mechanics that means no two electrons can simultaneously occupy the same quantum state, and so cannot be pushed into a volume smaller than their quantum probability cloud. A star held up in this way is called a white dwarf, a dim, fading ember, as heavy as a star but the size of the Earth, which will quietly wend through the eons in a comfortable retirement. But, if a white dwarf happens to be over 1.44 times the mass of the Sun, the so-called Chandrasekhar limit, then electrons will not be enough. The weight of the star will slam the negative electrons into their parent atoms, fusing with positive protons to form neutrons. These neutrons will then mash into one another, essentially transforming the star into one gigantic atom. The end result is a neutron star, a raging magnetic monster heavier than the sun but the size of Manhattan, its poles generating a quadrillion times the magnetic force of our own planet, its surface 
riven by magnitude 20 starquakes. Neutrons defy gravity with more alacrity than electrons do, but if the mass above them happens to be in excess of 2.17 solar masses, even they must give. Put simply, there is nothing known in the universe that can keep such a star from going down, and down, and down, forever. And that is a black hole, a place down from the universe itself. Stars large enough to suffer this fate are rare, both because they rarely form and because they live incredibly short lives. In order to produce a neutron star of the required mass, a star must possess an initial mass above 25 times that of the Sun, a number unmatched even by fabled giants like Betelgeuse and Antares. The closest candidate for a future black hole is Zeta Puppis, or Naos, a blue supergiant 56 times the mass of the Sun and about a thousand light years away. However inconceivable stellar mass black holes may be, the mechanism of their formation is fundamentally simple. Not so for supermassive black holes. It is known that they exist at the core of nearly every galaxy, and so are likely an intrinsic element of galaxy formation, but the role they play in galaxy formation is still not understood. Some scientists argue that supermassive black holes are merely side effects. The ruins of the births of giant primordial stars thousands of times more massive than the Sun. Others argue that they may be essential and that galaxies accrete around them. On a human level, supermassive black holes are gigantic. The one at the core of the galaxy M87, which was imaged by the Event Horizon Telescope, has a mass six billion times that of our Sun and is large enough to swallow the orbit of Eris. But on a galactic level, they are tiny. None are larger than a star system, and every galaxy contains a hundred billion star systems. And yet, there exist several peculiar correlations between galaxies and their supermassive black holes. For instance, there is a correlation between the black hole's mass and the orbital speeds of stars in its disk. Some have seen this as evidence that black holes and their galaxies must have co-evolved, while others believe that they induced these effects during their active, raging quasar phase. Observed stellar mass black holes range in size from 5 to 80 times the mass of the Sun. The minimum estimated mass for a supermassive black hole is 100,000 times the mass of the Sun. Clearly, these are very different objects, and no black holes outside of these ranges, so-called intermediate mass black holes, have ever been found. That is not to say that there have been no attempts to predict them. One hypothesis, first proposed by Yakov Zeldovich in 1966, and elaborated on by Stephen Hawking in 1971, is actually quite elegant. It proposes that during the brief period after the Big Bang, when the universe was of sufficient pressure and density, black holes could have formed in the same manner as stars, as regions of matter overdensity fell into themselves. These primordial black holes, as they were called, could be any mass at all, from a hundred times the mass of the Sun, to that of the Earth, to as small as 10 micrograms. And finally, we arrive at the subject of the paper under discussion. And at this point, I re-emphasize, no primordial black holes have ever been found, and it is entirely possible that they don't exist. The authors of the paper never assert that Planet 9 is likely to be a black hole, only that it could be. Planet 9 is believed to be about six Earth masses, and primordial black holes, if they exist, can also be six Earth masses. Schultz and Unwin only argue that Planet Nine is just as likely to be a black hole as it is to be a planet. To make this assertion, the authors must discount the various hypotheses already proposed for Planet Nine's origin. That it formed in situ is, as everyone agrees, virtually impossible, given its supposed size and the scarcity of building material at Planet Nine's distance from the Sun, estimated at 500 AU. Another hypothesis, which is the one I promoted in my previous video on the subject, is the so-called Five-Planet Nice model, in which a third ice giant, Planet Nine in this scenario, was ejected early in the solar system's history by Jupiter. This they discard because, quote, the prospect of a planet forming near Uranus and Neptune before being scattered to its orbit is low, since in order to fall into a stable orbit, the planet would need to be appropriately influenced by a passing star, unquote. Instead, the article suggests capture from interstellar space as the most likely origin, since, quote, 
While there is a low probability of capturing an Earth-mass primordial black hole, it is no more improbable than capturing a free-floating planet of similar mass. Unquote. According to the paper's calculations, the capture rate for free-floating planets is identical to the capture rate for primordial black holes, since the latter would comprise a sizable portion of local dark matter. Oh yeah, dark matter. I suppose now I'll have to talk about that. The first evidence for dark matter was identified for measurements of the velocity of stars. According to Newtonian mechanics, the farther an object is from a system's center of gravity, the more slowly it orbits. This principle is cast iron for the solar system. Pluto's orbital speed is one-tenth that of Mercury. But when the motions of stars across the galactic disk were finally plotted, the same logic did not hold. Stars near the center of the disk had similar velocities to those near the edge of the disk. If our solar system followed this rule, Pluto would complete its orbit in just 25 years. Something was going on. Dark matter, at least in its modern form, got its name in 1932, courtesy of Fritz Wicke, a brilliant but exceedingly abrasive Swiss astronomer. Aside from his work with dark matter, Zwicky is also known today for theorizing the existence of gravitational lenses, modeling neutron stars with his colleague Walter Bade, refusing to accept the reality of the expanding universe, and referring to those who disagreed with him as, quote, spherical bastards, because they were bastards however you looked at them. His relationship with Walter Bade eventually descended into death threats, with Zwicky accusing him of planting a live rattlesnake in his observatory. Dark matter had first been observed in the stars of our own galaxy. When Zwicky applied similar formulae to the Coma Galaxy Cluster, he found a similar excess of speed in its outermost galaxies. Dark matter, it seemed, was everywhere. Either something was fundamentally wrong with our understanding of the universe, or the universe was more cluttered than we initially thought, over six times more, in fact. For the observed stellar and galactic speeds to conform to our understanding of physics... 85% of the matter in the universe must be invisible to our eyes. Early on, admirable attempts were made to suggest that what we call dark matter might be a bug in our understanding of physics. But over time, the lines of evidence for dark matter became so overwhelming that no amount of fiddling with the math could explain them all. It's important to note that the concept of dark matter has no bearing whatsoever on what dark matter actually is. Across media, you will see various things labeled as dark matter, usually black holes or subatomic particles. But these are only two hypotheses for the nature of dark matter. Dark matter could be any number of things, even in combination. The two most commonly cited concepts for the identity of dark matter are known as WIMPs, that is, weakly interacting massive particles, and MACHOs, massive compact halo objects. Yes, an American did coin those terms. As the name suggests, machos are large objects that orbit within the outer halos of galaxies. Suggestions for machos range from free-floating Jupiter-sized planets, to brown dwarfs, to even, yes, primordial black holes. In fact, astrophysicist Sebastian Klesa considers primordial black holes a prime candidate for dark matter because they are, quote, non-luminous, non-relativistic, and nearly collisionless. Unquote. This raises the question of how we could possibly detect such an object within our own solar system. Unwin and Schultz provide an actual size image of a five-Earth-mass black hole in their paper. Compared to that, Russell's teapot looks positively looming. Unwin and Schultz suggest, however, that black hole planet 9 might be detected through the halo of wimps it is believed to accrete. But, you might say, wimps are another form of dark matter. How could we find one form of dark matter by looking for another? Well, wimps are not called weakly interacting massive particles because they interact weakly. They are called that because they interact using the weak force. All conventional matter emits light, or, more technically, electromagnetic radiation, at certain frequencies, and so is composed of particles with an electromagnetic charge, positive protons, negative electrons, and neutral neutrons. But there also exists another form of matter, known as antimatter, with those electromagnetic charges inverted, with negative antiprotons and positive positrons. Should matter and antimatter come into contact, they would annihilate each other, 
converting every atogram of their combined mass into energy. Dark matter, on the other hand, does not emit light, and thus does not interact via the electromagnetic force. But there is another force it could employ, the weak force. The four fundamental forces which, as far as we know, govern every event in the universe, are electromagnetism, gravity, the strong force that binds quarks into protons and neutrons, and the weak force, which governs radioactive decay. We know that dark matter interacts with gravity, and also that it cannot interact with the strong force. Otherwise, cosmic rays, which are basically rogue protons, would react to it. So that leaves the weak force. Thankfully, the weak force has its own form of antimatter, particles that are aligned to the weak force just as antiparticles are aligned to the electromagnetic force. And it is this form of matter that Schultz and Unwin believe could provide the key to locating their black hole 9. If, and it's a big if, dark matter does interact with the weak force, it should be detectable through the annihilation of weak particles as they collide with anti-weak particles, assuming, of course, that there are such things as anti-weak particles. Let me be clear here. WIMPs have been a target for astronomers and particle physics laboratories across the globe for 30 years, and to date, not the feeblest signal of their existence or of their mirrored doubles has ever been detected. And so, that's the concept. Planet Nine just might be a form of dark matter we're not sure exists, orbited by another form of dark matter we're not sure exists, which might be detectable through its interaction with a third form of dark matter we're not sure exists, or it might be a planet. The paper's core argument is that the likeliest origin for Planet Nine, interstellar capture, is just as probable for a black hole as for a planet. But Brown and Batigan argue that the five-planet Nice model is still the best model for Planet Nine's formation. The paper argued that to be valid, the Nice model requires the passing star stabilize and circularize the ejected planet's orbit. But while passing stars are rare today, in the star cluster in which our solar system was born, stellar interactions were stronger and more frequent, and the chances of orbital stabilization far higher. There is, at present, simply no need to invoke black holes. As someone drawn to the boundary between the known and the unknown, I admire anyone willing to prod said boundary in quirky directions. By all means, seek your dragons. But in this age of instant folklore where untested ideas can become common knowledge by tomorrow, I humbly request that we, the internet-faring public, be patient and allow Planet Nine the grace of being a planet until we know it is not.